we expect from Clemson in this game, Sammy, if at anything at all? Or what do you expect from Georgia in this game? Dabo would love to be able to do that at the end of the season, for the record. He would love that. <laughs> I find it fascinating this line hasn't quite gotten to 14. It's getting close, but every time you think it's going to go to 14, it comes back the other way. There are some 13s in the market right now. It's some very sharp shops. So the fact that it's just under that big, fat 14 – is built in respect in the market for the dog. And my concern is this for Georgia, because Georgia wants to run over everybody. They want to play Jeff Schwartz football and just beat you to death in the offensive line, run you over, you know, run for 180 yards, set up the pass via the run. Can Georgia railroad Clemson for four quarters? I, I have my hesitations there. I haven't bet it yet. If I could get 14 for sure, I will fire the dog. But at this number, even at 13 and a half, I lean to Clemson. Yeah, I'm with Sammy, and I think he hit on the the key matchup here, and that is uh, the running game. And look, Clemson, look, they, they've set a standard for themselves. When you win national champions championships, uh, when you're not at that level anymore, that's why people are, are sort of down on them. But uh, I think, Barry, you bring up a good point where, okay, maybe they're not the national champion team of uh, the past with Lawrence and with Watson, but they still have pros on defense. And I think, you know, I, you never want to base a handicap on a game from three years ago. I think that was 2021, the ugly 10-3 game where nobody could really move the ball. And I think it was Labor Day weekend, too, or early in the season. Yep. But I, I kind of sense a similar game where uh, I just don't know that Georgia can score enough to uh, you know, to cover this number. And you know, every time it, it has hit 14, I think, a, a couple times. But it's that – and you see that with some of these matchups. It, it's a ping-pong match. Miami-Florida has been the same way where every time it gets a three or three and a half, it gets bet down. Every time it gets bet down, it gets back up. So uh, I think Clemson plays good enough defense to hang in this game I, I would bet clemson if anything the problem with clemson is their quarterback yes. who is far worse on the road in neutral site than at home he has three times the interceptions he throws on the road or, or neutral site than at home and just look at the better defenses they played last season to put a 50 of passes against notre dame for 109 yards miami 52 percent of passes florida state 65 that's good for him south carolina 55 percent like at Duke the, early in the season, week one, yep. they lost, right? 62%. Like, is Clay Klubnick better in year two of this offense? If he's not, they're not going to cover this game. It, it might be low scoring. It might be 28-10, but I don't expect them to move the ball well if he's not playing much better. Do I feel comfortable enough to lay it with Georgia? I don't think so, Bear, in this spot. But we got to see more from that quarterback position to feel comfortable that Clemson can cover this game. Yeah, I think of everything in, in, in this game, I think under 48 and a half would be – uh, what I would look at here, because just as the lack of faith in Clemson's quarterback and in, in Georgia's defense usually does pretty good uh, against these non-conference opponents that don't see Kirby Smart's defense year in and in, in year out. So we, we could very easily be looking at like a, a 27-14 type game where Kirby's just uh, re reliant on running the ball, using those tight ends, even, even without uh, Bowers, they, they're loaded loaded at tight end still. They, they got a, a a bunch of guys there who contribute. So, yeah, under 48 and a half would be the play here for, for me in, in this game. So then the other – one of the other ranked – the other ranked matchup on Saturday, uh, Notre Dame at Texas a and This is a game is basically seen uh, one-way action on the, uh, on the Aggies here. Uh, I mean, I think it was a pick earlier at some point during the year. It was one for a while. Now A&M out to three against the Notre Dame team, who I think we all kind of have some concerns uh, on what we're going to see from the Irish's offensive line. Uh, obviously, you've got the familiarity with Elko and Riley Leonard. Uh, Notre Dame, do they have the playmakers to really uh, – separate against what should be another really good A&M defense? And does A&M have the playmakers on the offensive side of the ball? Because remember, last year, if it wasn't for Evan Stewart or Anaya Smith, they weren't moving the ball. And, and they lost a running back earlier in camp. So A&M may have struggles moving the ball as well. 46 and a half was the total I saw. I like under 46 and a half here. Well, any, any plays on this one? I'm with you, and yeah, you could have uh, you could have gotten A and M plus a couple of points during the summer, and this total has come down to 48 and a half, 49. So uh, my favorite play is Notre Dame team total under 21 and a half. It's only minus 115 in a couple books, uh, for the reasons you mentioned. Notre Dame inexperienced on the offensive line. It's all freshmen. It's all sophomores. It's only a handful of combined starts between the guys they're going to throw out there. And you're talking about an SEC team on the road, uh, a really good front four for A and M. You got a bunch of NFL guys on that A and M. 
defensive line. I, look, I, I don't know what's true and what's not with the NIL. I did hear somebody told me A and M has spent almost like ten million dollars in NIL on their on their oh, defensive I'm sure. line, it, it, which is just include, insane. If you include Nolan, who's now gone to to Ole Miss, totally, and I'm sure they they dropped a pretty penny on Nick Certain from uh, to get bring in from Purdue as well. Yeah, I mean that's almost what Jeff got when he went to Oregon. I don't <laughs> yes. know if it was uh, NIL or, yeah, or more, what that, actually, yeah. that suitcase was, but uh, under, no, look, under the table. To drop it yes, off the absolutely. Little uh, little blue chips with uh, with happy <laughs> dropping dropping off the tractor, the duffel bag of cash. Uh, I just think Notre Dame's gonna have a hard time scoring. Elko knows Riley Leonard, and that's always a matchup that favors the coach because the the coach knows what the quarterback likes. He doesn't like, especially a defensive mind like Elko. I don't think the the quarterback Leonard is sitting there, you know, thinking about uh, what does my coach like or dislike. It, it's the other way around. I think of some of those uh, matchups when uh, when the Bills had Drew Bledsoe and he just came from the Patriots and they'd have to go to New England. And play the Patriots. Belichick would just, you know, pick pick him apart, undress him. So I, I see a similar sort of matchup here. Twenty one and a half is a key number. I don't think they get the three plus touchdowns and uh, and beat me. Notre Dame team total under twenty one and a half here, Sammy. How about twenty one twenty Irish? Oh no, Perfect. you need under twenty one twenty A and M. That's better, right? Yeah, that's better you, because yes. yeah, Notre Dame under ten and a half wins, wins for the year. Yeah, I'll take that one. That's, that's better for Will though. No, I thought he said twenty one and you say twenty one and a half or twenty and a half. Twenty one and a half team total under for Notre Dame. Oh, so either way, whatever. Either way. Keep it close. I think Notre Dame's D line is gonna dictate how this game plays. And let's also understand in years past when Notre Dame has gone on the road in the SEC, they're catching a lot more than three, guys. They're catching seven, they're catching ten. This is respect, I believe, for the Irish. And I think if Jeff did not lie to me, Jeff jumped in with me last week on Notre Dame plus three when the two and a halves were starting to turn. It was like the leaves in the fall. They go from green, they get into that reddish color, and then they just fall off. I believe plus three is a solid bet. I'd be curious enough the threes are going to last. We might see this come back the other way. And uh, I think Notre Dame plus three is one of my favorite bets of the weekend. It's getting a little popular to take A&M, but you could have done it at a pick em. You could have taken some points maybe before that. You could have laid one. You could have laid two. Now you're going to lay three. Worst time to bet right now at minus three. Uh, Sammy, I'll be quite honest. I'm I'm a little worried about this wager, buddy, because um, <laughs> so why? The, Fires the, I, 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 from Schwartz. I did take Notre Dame under 21 and a half points as well, um, as I did more research on their offensive line. It's a, it's a problem, guys. Like, we're going to see this theme, I think, throughout the first couple of weeks. Um, there's a lot of young offensive linemen going on the road in situations I think are really tough for them. And the thing about Notre Dame's offense is. You know, when you're on the road like this, you need to generate explosive plays. You cannot have 10, 12, 13, 14 play drives with an inexperienced offensive line. They're going to get your quarterback killed. So I don't think Notre Dame can generate the explosive plays to get themselves in a situation to score enough points to maybe keep up with AM. The only reason why. Sammy, I like Notre Dame in this spot. Is everyone's an AM. I, I every year we do this with with AM. And look, it's a talented team. I think they're seventh in overall team talent, uh, the the composite uh that 24-7 puts together. But they have a new coach. They're unproven in a lot of places, a lot of hype again. And you know, I think Notre Dame matches up well, as you mentioned, with their defense against AM's offense. So I still have the plus three, but I'll stuck the Notre Dame under 21 and a half. I do worry about their offensive line. It, it's a tough task. A bunch of freshmen on the road, loud environment. It's going to be hot, right? It's a 730 kick uh, Eastern, but 630 Central going to be hot there as well for the Irish. Uh, it feels like a tough uphill battle for them. It, it's interesting because everyone talks about Kyle Field and this great home field advantage. If you go back since 2000, Texas A&M in games where they are ranked and they are hosting a top 10 team, they're 3-10. and 10. So it's not like they pull many upsets. And that goes back over five different coaches, RC for Coach Fran, Mike Sherman, Summy, and and, and Jimbo. So it's interesting that they just always, even these kind of hype ranked big matchups come into play. They never can quite get over the hump recently. I mean, that the Alabama win uh, on that last second sidewinding field goal, AM was a kind of an afterthought in that game. They were a massive underdog, uh, weren't ranked. So, I do expect a a lower scoring game in this one, and, and hopefully be uh, it'll be good viewing after uh, I hit the road from Morgantown, where Big Noon will be on on Saturday morning. Uh, Penn State now down to eight, I see as a favorite over the uh, the, the Mountaineers. This is a, a game where I like Penn State in this game. Uh, I laid the eight. Uh, 
I was ready to lay eight and a half, and then, and then I, I I waited. I'm like, yeah, let me just see. It's come down some already, and see if it can maybe come down some more, and I don't have to buy it down to eight. And sure enough, it did come down to eight. If you and, and this is courtesy of uh, Ralph Michaels, who uh, I did a pod with a few weeks back. If you and this is not the reason why I'm playing Penn State, but it is a pretty damning number. Not damning. It's an unbelievable number since 2000. If you look at James Franklin, Penn State, in games that they are favored by seven point by between seven points and twenty four points, so basically you're eliminating the games that have long been 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 decided blow uh, blowout type uh, rejected games. So like games with kind of kind of something in there, sixteen zero and one against the number. It's just it's almost impossible. I had to go back and look between seven and twenty four points. If you just look at as a, t- a touchdown favorite or more. 26 and one. So that's still pretty damn good itself. But I worry about West Virginia here. I know they're they're talking a, a big game about how uh, Penn State ran it up on them last year, scored late. But if you look at the three games West Virginia played last year against teams that wound up finishing the year ranked 0 and 3, lost by an average of 25 points a game. So they beat the teams that they should have beaten, maybe pulled a little a little upset uh, along the way to get to a surprise nine win season. I'm not necessarily sold that Drew Aller is the guy to necessarily handle Andy Colton-Nicky's offense, but I think between that offensive line and the running backs, Allen and Singleton, a defense which should still be great, uh, even though they lost some guys off the best defense in the country last year. Tom Allen now in, is familiar with the conference, familiar with that area of the country. I think Penn State is still going to be very, very good. I would be very disappointed and surprised, uh, Sammy, if they did not win this game by double digits. Let me poll the room real quick. Since 2005, in terms of ATS, where do we think James Franklin ranks? Let's go around the horn real quick. Out of all the coaches, where does he rank ATS since 2005? Give me a guess. Overall ATS? I'll say I think he covers a a bunch of games. He always seems to score late to get that cover. Uh, 57%. I'm going to say it's, it's... are we talking like a like a ranking in the standings? Like where he I was, was going to say, give me the place. So Jeff guessed a percentage. Will <laughs> Will almost nailed it. He is third since oh, two thousand five. I win the you prize. Remember, you got to remember too. He was back at Vandy catching points and all those games and and before like people really caught on to like what he was able to do at Vandy turning that program around. So yeah, that does not surprise me at all. But he covers as a favorite at Penn State. I think the most unfair treatment for James Franklin is to compare him to Urban Meyer or Jim Harbaugh or whatever because he's just not that guy. But in terms of covering as a favorite, and you gave the Ralph Michaels stat as a favorite, this guy makes you money. The only two coaches that are better ATS since 2005 are Mike Gundy and Jim Tressel. That's it. He is better than every other coach to put him on the sidelines. This guy is just one of those dudes that finds a way to cover the number. And the other part about Franklin, I say this in a respectful way. Uh He's kind of a prick. He knows what the number is. (laughs) He knows that the boosters want to cover the number. And how many times, whether it be the West Virginia game, the game last year against Northwestern, when he had the backup take a fake knee and throw a touchdown pass to cover like 27 and a half, he knows what the number is, and late in games, he tries to cover that thing, guys. So I'm not laying, or I'm not taking eight. You know, I saw this dip down to seven and a half for a brief second, got blasted back up. You know, you could have taken 10 with Westva. Now you're going to take eight against a coach who's ticked <laughs> off, who wants to cover, and is probably going to cover. Mm-mm. It's Penn State or pass for me. Yeah, I think you guys pretty much covered. I don't have too much to add other than I, I might look at a Penn State team total over 30 and a half because I do think they'll get their points. Um, you know, I I probably would have leaned towards West Virginia. Bears dissertation there, pro- I think, talked me off of it a little bit. And like Sammy said, you, you're going to take eight when you could have taken 10. That's not a good habit to get into. I think Penn State with Colton Nicky uh, gets their points here. I think it's a good matchup for the Penn State offense. So Penn State o- team total over 30 and a half, I think, is a good play. Just remember, all offseason, all James Franklin has, has heard is the offense couldn't produce explosive plays. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. They can't do it. What's he going to try to do in week one? Produce a lot of points to shut everyone up. 
right? Like I, I think that, that Will's onto something here with the offensive explosion we could see with, with with Penn State. And to Sammy's point, is that it's not going to stop, right? Like he's not going to be up. 31, you know, 14 or 31, 17 and say to himself, oh, we're done. No, he keeps going and going and going down year over year. So I think they look to make a statement offensively in this game. Now, West Virginia offensively has a lot back, though. They might be able to keep up at some points, but I think Penn State's defense, while losing a lot, has recruited very well over the years. I think Penn State covers this game and they score a bunch of points. Yeah, I think they're really expecting Trey Walls to have a big impact. And we'll see if Julian Fleming, the Ohio State transfer, can give them a little bit more. Uh, in the past game, I'm not. I'm not sure Ohio State was too disappointed or uh, dismayed that 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 Fleming left, being that you know, the Buck has have so many wide receivers. But at Penn State, we'll see if he can uh, if he if he can fill a role and, and help that Lions offense. So I've already got my Saturday planned. Show from ten to noon, big noon. We got. I'll be in Morgantown, kick, taking that one in. Uh, Penn State, West Virginia. We're going to finish up. We're going to do some some segments, I'm sure. And then I'm going to be in a car with hopefully brewed by a fellow Miami guy, Bruce Feldman. And I'm going to have the iPad up. I'm going to be watching the Canes and the Gators. Canes uh, about two and a half point favorite now. Total is around 54. As a Miami alum, I am scared to death of, of this game. All we have seen and heard in the offseason is about the, the, the portal and Cam Ward, and, and you, you, you br- you're bringing Damian Martinez, you're bringing Sam Brown, you're bringing Barrow from Michigan State, Barron from Tennessee. Like they, no, no team outside of Ohio State has really uh, gone as portal heavy as Miami has. And, and you, on the other side, Miami, oh, they're going to win the ACC. They're a sleeper national championship contender if everything goes right. And on the other side, in Gainesville, you got old Billy Napier who has already been fired by all of his head coach, by all of his fan bases and everyone around the SEC. What are they going to do with quarterback Graham Mertz, whatever? Guys leaving the program. Uh, your win total is four and a half. You're going to uh, – losing season. This couldn't be a worse setup for Miami as a small road favorite going on the road to an SEC rival, uh, in-state rival who's expected to have a bad a bad season. Like it, You couldn't ask for at least for a better emotional setup and an intangible setup. Jeff, like how, how much, how, like put yourself, take me back to like 19-year-old Jeff Schwartz, 20-year-old Jeff Schwartz, and, and he heard all offseason about how his team was going to suck, and you've got uh, this top potentially ACC champion coming in, in-state rival how would how would that have been received in the locker room amongst the staff like like does this does this, does this stuff really play or am i making too much out of it? it it plays early in the game and then miami's offensive defensive lines that are better take over right and like it, it's fun for the first quarter you're at home right it's gonna be a, a crazy atmosphere you're gonna be hot you'll be sweaty um you've heard all year that you might not play well your coach might be fired all those things you're exactly right bear but then by the third quarter, when all those guys that, that Mario has recruited to beat up to beat up people in the trenches start taking over, it doesn't matter how motivated you are. And and that's the difference in this game, right? For 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 this is Mario's third year in Miami. He did what you should do, right, Bear, which is you recruit high school players in the trenches, you supplement with some transfer portal players, and in year three, all those guys develop. And now you're ready to, to, you know, to kick ass this season, which I think Miami is going to do. I like the addition of Cam Ward, I like the addition of, of, of Martinez. And I think they win this game. Look, I've said this for years now. I'm not worried about a Mario Cristobal coach team in a big game. He came through. I watched it happen to Oregon. They went to Ohio State as a 14-point underdog and beat Ohio State in the trenches. That's how they won that game. When they go play Cal Bear in week seven, I'll pick, I'll take Cal plus the points, okay? I'm not taking it here. So I think Miami wins this game. I think they cover this game. Uh, they're the better team, and they show up under Mario in these big games. He's not making that statement. He hired a clock management coach. Finally, like he, he like he realized there's a problem. So I I appreciate that from him, uh, Sammy. I think that uh, Miami covers this game and wins. You, I'm all in on the U. It, it is what it is. It's already done. I've talked about this for a month. I'm taking the U. I've taken the U. Got him to make the playoff. I'm not scared. I think Mario channels all this doubt, and they come out and whoop up on Florida. Florida's win total is four and a half, guys. Florida's not that good. 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of that, that's uh, about the toughest schedule you're ever going to see, not just in the country, but any year ever. I mean, that Florida schedule is brutal. Uh, I, I would lean towards taking the SEC team at home, getting the points. Now, you missed the three, you missed the three and a half, so I don't really want to sit here and pound the table for plus two and a half. But uh, I'll tell you this, I'm excited to watch the game because whoever loses, that coach is immediately like under the microscope. We talked about this last week, where if it's Napier, like Bear said, he's already been fired, fired a million times. Cristobal, with all their spending in NIL, they come off a seven and six season, they get... Uh, Smoked in the bowl game against Rutgers of all teams, uh, and there's going to be some pressure if he starts 0-1. Uh, there's going to be you know some finger pointing and saying, "Hey, what's going on? Do we really have the right right guy?" So uh, I'm most excited for this game. If I could only watch one game this weekend, it would be this one.